the next uh, lecture now. So I will uh, soon invite uh, Lea Catherine Sacca here to present her lecture titled The Space of MTV from Inner City Clubbing to Basement Suburbia. Uh, maybe a few words uh, about Lea Catherine. She essentially reinvented the idea of uh, studying uh, uh, architectural exhibitions and following this uh, intense study of a period of the uh, end of the 17th, beginning of the 80s, she quietly became one of the most uh, uh, important expert about postmodern architecture. And this uh, lecture is relating to her work at the Department of uh, Architectural Study of um, University of Manchester, where she come from, uh, and I just asked to welcome her and good luck for your presentation. Let's see if it works here. Okay, just um, okay. Thank you, Roberto. Um, so Roberto is an old friend. You can see. Yeah. So from the, I'm, I'm glad there was the other presentation because otherwise I would have had to go between uh, from the 17th century to the 1980s, so quite a big jump. Um, I will present today, well, first I would like to thank Roberto and Vera and Javier and everybody on the project to invite me. I think it's a really exciting um, collaborative research project and it fits quite well with this uh, work on MTV that I've started uh, more or less uh, towards the beginning of the pandemic, so maybe, what is it, two years ago, a year and a half ago, uh, with a grant from the Graham Foundation. Uh, I was doing work on television and postmodernism, and then I thought that, you know, probably the most postmodern form of television was MTV, and that I would love to look into it, but without really knowing uh, how, let's say. So um, this invitation is also an occasion I think as it is often the case to, to shape the project and to see how it can fit into this uh, idea of nocturnal histories of architecture. Um, I was also invited by Vera a few months ago to present here at HEAD, so some of you might have heard um, some of this work before. I tried to make it a bit different, but hopefully you won't get uh, too bored if you have heard the, the previous presentation. So I will start now. Uh, okay, and I will lecture in English, but um, for the practicality of the thing, but then, of course, I can take a question in French as well. So in 2013, uh, this book was actually mentioned in the introduction. In 2013, art critic Jonathan Crary published the essay 24-7, Late Capitalism and the Ends of Sleep, a book in which he explores some of the damaging consequences of the expanding non-stop processes of 21st century capitalism. Through this book, Crary shows how the marketplace now operates through every hour of the clock, ignoring any forms of distinction between day and night. A specialist of the study, as you probably know, a specialist of the study of vision and perception, Crary, with this latest book, uh, which is great, by the way, small, uh, I re really recommend it, describes the ongoing management of individual attentiveness and the impairment of perception within the compulsory routines of contemporary technological culture. Late capitalism is dominated by global infrastructure for continuous work and consumption. So it's kind of a nonstop flow as he describes it. It is an epoch in which any persisting notion of sleep as somehow natural is now rendered unacceptable. As shown on the cover, and there are many different, this is the cover of the Italian version, which I think is the nicest. I showed you the English before. So different cover, it was translated in many languages, including French, by the way. So as shown by the cover of Crary's book, illustrated by the facade of a generic skyscraper at night time, this condition is undoubtedly linked to perpetual illumination, a condition of modernity, and as we heard in the last presentation. So from the mid 20th century, 
multi-story buildings also saw their windows lit by the glow of television sets. I couldn't find an image. I would have loved to find an image of a skyscraper with TV everywhere, but I couldn't find it. So, um, so as Crary writes, and I quote him, the cathode ray tube was a decisive and vivid instance of how the glare and gossip of a public transactional world penetrated the most private of spaces. Television quickly redefined what constituted membership in a society. Expanding on the role of television in uh, this 24-7 condition, Crary writes that television was a site of destabilization of relations between exposure and protectedness, between agency and passivity, between sleep and awakening, and between publicness and privacy. As he explained, from the early 1950s into the 1970s, television was a stable system with a small number of channels and durable programming formats. Viewing was synchronized and networks had their offering conform to traditional sleep patterns of human being. So as you see in this image, a kind of nuclear family, uh, probably in what the 1950s, watching a, um, a tennis match, uh, probably on a Sunday afternoon. So, you know, television was kind of following the, the, the day routine of, of the family up until the, the 70s. Yet this post-war era of television was clearly over by the mid 1980s, even as early as 1983, the wide availability of VCR and the standardization of the VHS video, video game consoles and fully commercialized cable TV, that's what we will talk about today, significant, significantly, significantly altered the positions and capabilities of what had been television up to then. Television has co had colonized by then important areas of, of, of lived time and of our homes. So as you see on this um, advert for a Sony uh, Betamax from the 1978, watch whatever, whenever. So that's what changes in a way in the 1980s. So in this paper, I would like to argue that in the early 1980s, with the advent of the American pay television channel MTV, the idea of the media house was pushed and transformed into a space of domestic performativity, dominated by night vision and organized around continu a continuous stream of omnipresent images. Uh, I will, the, the presentation will be divided in three sections. In the first one, I will draw a short history of the television channel, an innovative company called Music Television or MTV. And I will explain how, I will explain MTV's modus operandi and politics of distribution between also center and periphery. In the second section, I will talk about new forms of domestic performativity and interactivity that emerge around the late 1970s and early 1980s at the same time as MTV uh, appeared. And third and last, I will briefly present two architectural projects, both conceived in the, in the 1980s and both in the context of exhibitions and two projects that touch upon this idea of new forms of domestic performativity which expand into the night and involve the interaction with television sets. So now the first part. Seven, six, five, four. We've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. Ladies and gentlemen, rock and roll. This is it. Welcome to MTV Music Television, the world's first 24-hour stereo video music channel. Now, just moments ago, all of the VJs and the crew here at MTV collectively hit our executive producer, Sue Steinberg, over the head with a bottle of champagne, and behold, a new concept is born. The best of TV combined with the best of radio. Now, starting right now, you'll never look at music the same way again. 
We'll be right back to introduce the other VJs and the other folks who are going to be with us on MTV. I'm Alan Hunter. I'll be with you right after Mark. We'll be covering the latest in music news coast to coast here on MTV Music Television. I'm Martha Quinn. The music will continue non-stop on MTV Music Television, the newest component of your stereo system. Well, all right, I'm J.J. Jackson, and I'll be sitting in with the latest video music performances the way they were meant to be. That's in stereo on MTV Music Television. You'll never look at music the same way again. Hi, I'm Nina Blackwood, and I'll be with you after J.J. right here on MTV, the world's first video music channel, all day, all night, in stereo. Are those guys the best? We all are so excited about this new concept in TV. We'll be doing for TV what FM did for radio. And let's get into it right now at MTV. So on 1st of August 1981, Music Television, or MTV as it's uh, known, uh, first transmission opened with, as you heard, the famous lazy, Ladies and Gentlemen Rock and Roll. Over a footage of 1969 NASA moon landing, it combined rock music with holy images of what was still, by then, the most famous moment in the history of television and the most technologically advanced moment of mankind, uh, the moon landing. MTV team turned into an emblem of an entire generation. The network, initially focusing primarily on rock music, had been launched by two, Amer uh, two, of, American, uh, two of America's largest conglomerates, uh, in 1979, so the, the first transmission is in 1981, but it starts the idea in 1979, American Express bought half of a company called Warner uh, Cable Corporations as they envisioned ca cable TV as a, as a sale tool to deliver goods and services directly into the homes. Together, they formed Warner Amex Satellite Entertainment Company, or WASEC, which created and developed several succe successful cable network. So one of them was MTV. And this is a, a, an article um, from uh, the New York Times in uh, 1985 talking about Robert Pittman, who was the, one of the co-founder of, the, um, of, the of MTV. Uh, yeah, so it says Robert Pittman begins a new music channel. So if this idea of showing music videos around the clock, 24-7, uh, first sounded like a foolish idea to most specialists and businessmen, visionary minds such as MTV co-founder Robert W. Pittman succeeded in creating a need that did not previously exist. Directed to the themes, a demographically defined group of people located primarily in the suburbs of and the rural region of America, the new TV channel had to construct its own audience by cultivating the need for this format, the music video, that did not previously exist. As explained by Robert Tannenbaum and Craig Marks in, in a book about the history of MTV, uh, teenagers were the demographic group least interested in TV because TV wasn't interested in teens. Children had cartoons, adults had evening news and most of the shows that followed it. But teens were an untapped audience, an invisible power. MTV gave them what they wanted and got them not only interested in but obsessed by MTV, making it their clubhouse. In the United States particularly, the cable market was, in the early 1980s, suddenly in search of new and original content to fill the long programming hours, and MTV appeared as the easiest and cheapest solution, using promotional video clips as its main input. MTV was thus able to produce an entirely new form of cultural production that came to dominate the music industry for most of the 80s and the 90s. So basically all these, uh, all these cable networks started to appear and moreover they were 24 seven. So there was a lot of hours of content to, to fill and then MTV was quite clever in imagining this format where they didn't really have to produce the content because the, 
the record company would produce the content for them because they would con MTV would convince the record company that if they want to have a successful artist, they needed a, a music video. So they only had to pay for the VJs and they didn't have to really pay for the content. So it was quite a, a good idea, let's say. So music video, a perfect alliance between music and picture, did inde indeed kill the radio star. If music video existed way before the arrival of MTV, the new cable network really created an industry for them, foreseeing that the target audience for the channel, young people who had money and the inclination to buy things like records, candy bars, video games, beer and pimple cream, had an increased economic power. In the early 1980s, record companies started to produce these music video that provided MTV with free content, that, they, that could fill their hours and hours of programming. And it was the format of the music video, an extremely short four minutes in, uh, um, in average text that maintained us or the teens in an excited state of expectation. This kind of, you know, you always want to see the next video, what's gonna come. So this, this uh, excited state or, or perpetual state of expectation contributed to the hypnotic effect and constant sense of expectation that made the success of MTV. In the early 1980s, cable operators were very reluctant to distribute MTV because it was wanting to, to create the channel, but it also needed to be distributed by the cable company. But starting from the principle that it was from young people's demand that operators would accept to carry their content, MTV's executive came up with the I want my MTV slogan. They imagined a publicity campaign that would capitalize on kids' series sense of ownership, asking music personalities such as Mick Jagger, Cyndi Lauper, or Madonna to repeat the motto call your cable company and tell them, I want my MTV. So basically they wanted the customer to call the cable company to say, we want you to distribute this, this stuff. So apparently uh, appealing to this young generation, MTV was akin to an early social network. It created a new relationship between popular music and mass media, changing the very format of television making. America, demand your MTV! I want my TV. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. Call your cable company and say I want my MTV. Turn it on. Leave it on. America, see the music you want to see. I want my MTV. All right. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. Ow! 24 hours a day on cable TV. I want my MTV, MTV, MTV! Yeah, too much is never enough. Okay, so but the new TV channel was also contributed, uh, was also uh, conditioned, sorry, by the politics of broadcasting. Unlike clubs and other inner urban phenomenon, MTV reached out to the suburban and small town areas. The distribution logic of cable television and early experiments in narrow casting meant that MTV first appeared in suburban and rural area where the cost per mile for digging and installing cable was cheaper than in big cities. Therefore, parallel to the institutionalization, it is a difficult word to say, uh, of new forms of domestic entertainments, MTV also operated a territorial shift introducing young American suburban dwellers to the culture of urban city centers. American teenager could suddenly take part in a whole tranche of cultural activity from the family living room or via the second television set from their own bedroom. So this form of domestication of youth entertainment ushered in a wider cultural shift of focus from public and collective spaces to the private space of the household. MTV did not only contribute to sell records and advertising, it also ushered in a transformation of the home thanks to the multiplication of television screens in the kids' bedroom, in the basement, and other domestic spaces. It colonized the space of the home and family time, day and night. 
So now to my second part, between domestic performativity and early technological interactivity. In 1956, and in the context of the exhibition This is Tomorrow at the Whitechapel Art Gallery in London, artist Richard Hamilton pro produced this very famous collage called Just What Is It That Makes Today's Home So Different, So Appealing. An image that is now amongst the most famous in British post-war post art, the collage uh, by Hamilton was made of images sourced from popular media, in particular a stash of American magazines. And it points to the increasing importance and centrality of, or oh, this is my interpretation, it points to the impor importance and centrality of television in 1950s American and also British uh, domestic life. So you see that the television is quite in, in the middle of the, of the thing. But in addition, through the window, you can see a night vision of the city, a widely reproduced photograph of the exterior of a cinema in 1927, showing the premiere of an early talky film, The Jazz Singer. And you see also that the exterior is sort of black and white, while the interior is lit and uh, in color. In the post-war period, when television started to enter private interior, it was seen as a window into the world. So here you see, for example, a family watching the, the famous moon landing. So that was one of these uh, so-called media events where, where everybody was uh, gathering in front of the same uh, event everywhere around the world. So in her book, The Age of Television, author Mili Bonanno explains how domesticity is an essential prerogative of television, a sort of intangible and ontological characteristic. In the post-war period, television became an integral part of the family life, and home were transformed into theaters. Therefore, one could read this Hamilton collage as a comment on the relation between inside and outside the home suggesting that the space of entertainment, the new form of spectacle, was gradually shifting from the urban space to the domestic space. Now, if we come back to MTV and to the format of the music video, we can trace a genealogy from the format in the very public space of the discotheque in early 1980s New York. Indeed, the music video was arguably invented by Meryl Aldighieri, the first ever video jockey, or VJ, a term that she actually invented herself. Aldighieri was the first to make a video installation as a prominent feature component of the club's design with multiple monitors hanging over the bar and the dance floor. When New York City nightclub Hura invited Aldighieri to show her experimental film, she actually asked if she could develop a video to complement the DJ's music, so that, so that then her film would become part of the club ambience. So she basically created a full-time job for herself. From 1980 to 1981, Aldighieri was a full-time VJ, creating a new alliance between music and pictures. MTV directly brought music and club culture into the suburban home, colonizing domestic spaces such as basement living room and the teenager bedrooms, with a set, that's the first set, the original MTV, mimicking a 15 years old ideal basement hideaway, MTV intended to offer viewers a room of their own that also echoed an alternative world, and I would say an alternative world that mostly uh, was uh, happening at night. MTV appeared suddenly, American musician Dave Grohl. So there's a, a very interesting book actually called I Want My MTV, where uh, two guys did um, a series of interview and they, they, they did a sort of strange collage of all these interview uh, arranged thematically. So in this book, I found this quote by a musician, Nirvana and Food Fighter, Food Fighter musician Dave Grohl. Uh, he says, it seemed like at, at talking about MTV, he remembers. It, it seems like a transmission from some magical place. Me and all my friends were dirty li little rocker kids in suburban Virginia. So we spent a lot of time in the record store or staring at album covers. With music videos, there was a deeper dimension to everything. 
On Friday night, you'd go to a friend's house to get fucked up before going out to party, and you'd have MTV on. But before the advent of MTV, music television program were bringing the family together in front of the television, often before a night out. Top of the pop, for ex top of the pops, for example, a British music chart television program that made by the BBC, what bro was broadcasted weekly every Thursday evening on BBC One since 1964. It was viewed by 15 million people every night in its heyday. Uh, in its eighties in, in the seventies. Each weekly show consisted of performances from some of that week's best-selling popular music records that would brought to the whole family together in front of television. But the difference here was that with, with earlier music television, it was, it was a family thing, but with MTV, it became really a teenage thing. And it became also, um, it, it, it started to colonize other parts of the house that weren't the kind of um, commune uh, living room. So, um, so another, uh, another quote from someone who talks about this, this idea of watching music television as a, as a family thing, so before the arrival of MTV, he said, I remember it was a ritual. The whole family gathered around the TV to watch Top of the Pops. Even if your dad used to slag off the acts that were on, it was still a family thing. It was a mixed bag in those days in the charts, something for all the family. So it was also a way for parents to know what their kids were watching or were listening and, and vice versa. In the 1980s, the set of Top of the Pops had been redesigned to place the crowd in the studio around and behind the band so that they were in full view. The audience had always been part of the program, but now they were completely staged with professional dancers that would encourage an unnatural party atmosphere. So this idea of the kind of the house becoming the nightclub or becoming the party place was, was slowly uh, starting in the 1980s. So MTV was, was performative, but it was also born of an early experiment in interactive television. So that also this, this interactive uh, component. A few years before the creation of MTV, Warner Cable um, had come up with Cube, the first two-way interactive cable television system. So this is in a way the ancestor of MTV, an early form of narrow casting. So narrow casting is like uh, what was mentioned before Netflix, for example. From 1977 onwards, Cube computer terminals were being test marketed as part of a highly sophisticated cable communication system only in Columbus, Ohio in the US. Cube had the particularity of offering a plethora of specialized channel, one of which was Sight on Sound, uh, a channel dedicated to concert videos and other music programs. Following a logic of participatory programming, Warner Cable had commercialized this two-way multi-program cable television interactive system that allowed spectator to, and it was literally said in the, in the advertising for this thing, allowing the spectator to answer back to their television. So this idea that watching television was no longer only a passive uh, occupation. Offering a new type of interaction with technology, Cube was branded as the TV of the people, by the people, and for the people. It marked the beginning of an era of participatory as opposed to passive television. And as explained in, 19, in a 1978 special report that is actually available online, the system held the potential of revolutionizing the entertainment, audiovisual instruction, and educational industries amongst other. By greatly expanding the programming choice and by allowing the viewer to become an active participant, Cube operated a radical shift and advancement over what television or cable television had uh, her here to um, so far offered, bringing the potential of opening up the cities of America to cable television service on a profitable basis. So this is the kind of choices that you had on Cube. The same report predicted that Cube could be the first market skimmish in programming 
marketing and technological revolution marketing and a technological revolution that could profoundly affect the economy the gross national product the entertainment habits and the lifestyle of america and indeed it's the commercial potential of cube uh, cube like systems that had an enormous impact on the music recording and publishing industry so to come back to MTV, what MTV brought into the house was the performative atmosphere of the nightclub. It displays the idea of nocturnal entertainment from centers to peripheries, from inner city nightclubs to basement suburbia. Moreover, it conveyed a sense of interactivity with the television set. This idea that watching television was no longer merely a passive activity, but uh, one uh, but that one's living room could become the time of one night, a dance floor, to experience in solitary or in the company of a small restricted group of friends, a proper dance floor. So finally, transforming the media house, I will talk about a uh, um, more architectural project in that same uh, era of uh, the uh, beginning of MTV. Towards the end of the 20th century, Beatrice Colomina historicized and theorized the media house, stating in her 1995 assemblage article called The Media House, that at one level, the architecture is transformed by the media in which it is exhibited, and on another level, the design of the house concerns the media itself. In each moment of the 20th century, she writes, the house has been made to stand for different things, and in each case, this polemical use of the home depends on a particular use of the media. Yet, in the early 1980s, the media house changes, not only in its relation to space and technology, but also in its relation to time. In response to the advent of neoliberalism and the growing importance of the 24-7 condition described by Crary, the house also starts to function at night. So I will start by showing briefly a project by radical architect and researcher in visual art, Hugo La Pietra. Uh, Hugo La Pietra was, uh, amongst other things, very interested in looking at the domestic quality of the urban space and vice versa. So how the house gets in, the, the, the city gets into the house and how the house gets into the city. Uh, and this is his project from uh, April 1982. Again, you will notice that the two projects I will present are also um, born in the context of exhibition. So it seems to be a characteristic of the media house. Uh, so the, in, in April 1982, La Pietra proposed this project for La Casa Telematica, or the Telematic House, at the 61st Fiera Internazionale di Milano. The displayed project explored the implication of electronic memory and the potential impact of engaging uh, with, uh, sorry, of engineering and technology on domestic spaces. Beyond its techno-utopian rhetoric, La Pietra's house is characterized, characterizes the shift between the radical ethos of the 1970s and the hedonistic aesthetic of the 1980s. So of course the neon, a total embracing of unbribable consumerism resulting in a house full of screen and cameras dominated by abstract columns, neon lights and pastel colors. And here is how, sorry, I have a long quote on two slides, but I'm just gonna read it. This is how La Pietra describes the kind of condition of television in the 1980s. He, he says, the television-centric family seems to have abandoned all festive traditions, going to the cinema on Sunday, Saturday night parties, trip to the countryside, in exchange for a routine of watching television. In other words, for the continuous use of television set. From a physical point of view, there has not been much change in the spatial and distributive evolution of the home. However, if we carefully examine behaviors, it is noticeable how being together and talking, a functional characteristic that shaped the space and the distribution of objects, were in fact habits that gradually fell into oblivion. These were habits that were associated with a certain rituality 
and that still exists during the 1950s, even with the presence of the television, when there was only one channel, one film a week on Mondays, a rerun on Saturday night and the comedy on Friday. But with the arrival of television, however, uh, the, uh, the layout of this type of setting, living dining room, has been transforming from when the divide first appeared, often either hidden or placed inside a bookcase, to have, uh, sorry, when the divide, the divide device still ha uh, first happened, because first the television were kind of hidden in, in furniture, to having an increasing presence in the setting to the point of changing the arrangement and orientation of armchair, shifting the focal point from the center to a corner of the room. Uh, from 1954 to the 1970s, this was a slow process, he writes, and it is only in these last few years that we can see an acceleration in the transformation of the domestic space due to factors such as an increase in the number of channels, color TV and nonstop program extending, extended to 12, 16, 18 hours a day. In this way, television also appears in the bedroom, changing our, our evenings and habits with this space too. So La Pietra's exhibition house suggested a new sensory sphere in which the information and spectacle prevails. The home is transformed into a theater where everyone was at, is at once actor and spectator and set designer. The house itself looked like a television set in which different domestic spaces were adapted to the presence of the screen, with the dining table, as you see here, mutating into a triangular shape, focusing on the television set, the living room presenting a multi multiplicity of richly decorated armchair, each equipped with their own screen at the back, the more intimate space of the bedroom, including a table equipped with surveillance camera and a control station formed of three miniature screen, or a double bed split in two, half, each having a separate screen. La Pietra's project constitutes a key example of the media house in which screen multiplies while the media content invades the domestic space, increasingly blurring the boundaries between the simulacra and the set, the simulacra of the set and the reality of the house while letting the outside world in. The project had actually an earlier iteration, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going a bit anti-chronologically, uh, called also the Telematic House, uh, but it was called the Telematic House as Living Cell, and it was presented 10 years earlier at the MoMA exhibition Italy New Domestic Landscape, curated by Emilio Ambas. With this project, the earlier one, La, La Pietra anticipated the use of telematics and information technology with the home. For example, he imagined the Cicerone Electronico, a tool for getting audio information from urban space and bring them in private spaces. Suggesting a constant exchange of information between a single person in this home and the people in the public space. Yet we see that 10 years later, La Pietra's aesthetic has changed. The house is not only lit by the multiplicity of television screen, but also by an abundance of brightly glowing multicolor neon lights, suggesting an atmosphere of nightlife and postmodernity. Now the second project is a uh, 1986, so more or less the same period. Um, 1986, it was built in the context of the 17 Milan Triennale called the Domestic Project, uh, curated by Georges Tessot and I think Mario Bellini, where they ask uh, several people to uh, to produce um, a project and, and OMA, it's an OMA project. OMA presented the project La Casa Palestra, which means the house gymnasium, a fundamental but, but overlooked project in uh, OMA's career. And here you see uh, the shape of the house was actually um, modeled on the shape of the Triennale building that has a round uh, uh, part, so th this is where the project was uh, actually located, so built in full uh, scale. Starting from the, pre pre maybe Roberto has seen it, I don't know. Starting from the premise that modern architecture was always presented as lifeless, purit puritanical, empty, and un un uninhabited, OMA proposed modern architecture 
is in itself an hedonist, hedonistic movement, that its severity, abstraction, and rigor had in fact plots to create the most provocative settings for the experiment that is modern life. So here you see some images of the project. Uh, in this project, OMA bended the Barcelona pavilion to produce a programmatic, uh, programmatic intensity and systematically developed a project of its all human occupancy related to physical culture in the widest possible sense of the word. The house was bo both desecrated and inaugurated and showed its perfect appropriate, appropriateness for even the most suggestive aspect of contemporary culture. Action suggested by projection and light effects and an abstract soundtrack of human voice, somewhere in the ambiguous zone between exercise and sexual pleasure, completed this spectacle, whose aim was to shock people into an awareness of the possible hidden dimension of modern architecture. So here, there was one of the image, the few image on OMA's website has actually someone sort of performing in front of a television screen and uh, the plan, the detailed plan of the house. So like a nightclub, the house included exercise elements, mirrors, sound box, and horn speakers, reflection panels, laser, light spot, light boxes, neon, and television set. It also included vapor machine, blowers, and projections. So you see all this in the, in the chart. I mean, maybe now it's a bit small, but... Okay, so now to conclude, and to sort of uh, tie all this together, let's say, hopefully. Uh, so now to conclude, in 1974, Korean and artist Nam Joon Pei produced TV Garden, the image that you see here, a piece which, while revealing the artistic potential lurking behind television screens, also suggested an uncanny merging of nature and technology. And also, I would, uh, I would add a sort of um, nocturnal atmosphere. Today our domestic space is undergoing dramatic changes and at the center of this revolution is the presence of television screens or screens more broadly. A multiplicity of screens which are no longer windows into the world but which propel our private interiors into the public sphere. As shown in the 1983 film Videodrome by David Cronenberg in the early 90s, um, this, this kind of idea that uh, you know, we have this contact with television and that we almost um, enter the screen uh, is, is also um, a sort of fantasy of those, those early uh, 1980s uh, years. These forms of uninterrupted infrastructure pioneered by MTV and actually also CNN, because it's another channel that started exactly at the same time, didn't have the same sort of performative aspect, but had the same 24-7 uh, uh, characteristic and started at the same time as MTV. So these uninterrupted infrastructure pioneered by MTV and CNN marked the end of programming and the synchronization of continuous flows of content paving the way for narrow casting, in itself a technological form of fragmentation. It was no longer a case of a few channels chaired by the entire family, but of a multitude of content to choose from, all populated by highly diversified form of advertisement that were much more targeted towards specific demographic and social group within the population. Television was running day and night without clear temporal distinction and transformed the house into a space of interactivity and performativity. MTV and its related format of the music video were an important component of this late 20th century media environment. They emerged at a precise moment in time and through the convergence of three different factors, technological, social, and economic. And while they became for a time central to the music industry, they also shaped the space around us both at the macro scale of the territory and in the, uh, the, in the relation between center and periphery, for example, and at the micro scale of the home. A perfect embodiment of the 24-7 theorized by Jonathan Crary, MTV blurs the distinction between day and night and transforms the house into a nightlife media environment. 
but now outdated MTV and music video have been replaced by other fleeting regime of visions, which impact on domesticity and territoriality are yet to be fully measured. Thank you. Tu veux que je gère les questions moi-même? Ah, bon, est-ce qu'il y a des questions? <laughs> Un guest en, 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 ouais, en personne. En personne, donc on lui laisse gestir les questions. Je peux, ouais. Est-ce qu'il y a des et questions? Moi, je vais amener les, les, les microphones dans la, dans la salle. Ah, Roberto, sinon, il faut que tu poses une question. Hein. Ah. Ça, je ne vais pas me poser une question à moi-même. Non, non, on va voir. Enfin, je trouve intéressant que vous preniez comme point de départ euh, MTV plutôt justement que CNN. Mm -hmm. Est-ce que ça répond peut-être à une question que je me suis posé depuis un moment concernant ces, ces, ces télévisions euh, en continu, c'est la fragmentation de l'image constamment. Mmh. Et je me demande si vous ne mettez pas le doigt dans votre histoire là, sur euh, un... C'est là que ça ne devient pas clair pour mmh. moi. Sur peut-être quelque chose qui dépasse la, 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 la question de l'histoire de l'architecture, mais est-ce que vous... Met... Avec MTV, vous ne trouvez pas un paradigme d'un de, de, changement de perception qu'on vivrait, euh, disons, à l'ère postmoderne, ouais. qui serait ouais. en fait une espèce de, de l'abolition de la distinction entre le son et l'image. Parce que des, des, des images ensemble, on en a depuis les retables, mais des images en mouvement simultané, ça suppose de développer quelque chose comme une polyscopie, euh, comme on avait une polyphonie. Et je, je me demande si ça... Vous voulez dire la, de, que... bah, la capacité, en fait, déjà le fait de pouvoir faire avancer deux films en même temps, ouais. ou plus, ouais. ou alors d'avoir des films et puis des choses écrites en dessous, comme ouais, on a dans les chaînes ouais, en continu. Ouais. Et si ça ne demande pas un développement chez les créateurs, mais aussi chez nous, les, les, les spectateurs ou les récepteurs de tout ça, si ce n'est pas une, une, un bascule dans le... Je ne sais pas où le, à quel niveau le dire, au niveau phénoménologique ouais, ouais. ou je ne sais pas. Il bah, y a deux choses dans, dans, dans la question qui sont intéressantes. D'abord, je suis tout à fait d'accord. Après, moi, ce que j'essaie de faire tant, avec beaucoup de mal, c'est de ramener tout ça vers l'architecture. Donc, euh, c'est un peu ça. Non, non, mais j'ai aussi... C'est un peu compliqué, en fait, parce qu'au début, j'ai pensé à faire un projet sur MTV parce que je trouvais ça passionnant. Mais le, le nœud que je rencontre un peu, c'est comment justement le relier à l'architecture. Mais sinon, je trouve que... Parce que je suis quand même architecte. Donc, mais euh, sinon, je suis tout à fait d'accord. Premièrement, il y a la fragmentation euh, qui, qui relie aussi à l'idée du postmodernisme, la, la, la fragmentation postmoderne. On la voit dans... Aussi, le fait que ce soit des, des, des clips très, très courts et qu'il y a aussi une, une sorte de... C'est un peu le début de la perte de l'attention. On a, on, a, on a trois minutes et demie ou quatre minutes d'attention pour un vidéoclip, mais pas... Euh, donc, cette espèce de, de succession hyper rapide de, de, de clips très, très courts. Donc, oui, c'est un peu le début de ce qu'on connaît aujourd'hui, si je comprends bien la question. Oui, et ensuite, et... Je intéressant vraiment dans votre ouais. propos, que vous expliquez la fragmentation par la fin d'une séparation. Parce que MTV, le fait, j'avais jamais pensé à ça mmh. comme ça, mais le fait de dire c'est la télévision de la musique, mmh. ça veut dire qu'on va montrer euh, du son, quoi. On ouais, va montrer de l'image. Ouais, ouais. Et vous arrivez, avec le, ouais. le modèle que vous proposez là, vous expliquez pourquoi toute cette fragmentation dans laquelle on vivrait, elle serait peut-être le résultat en fait d'une fusion. Et ça, je trouve que c'est c'est quand même assez intéressant votre mmh. truc. Et en même temps, il y a une autre, une autre chose à quoi ça me faisait penser, c'est euh, là je l'ai pas mis dans la lecture, mais euh, Lev, Lev. Euh, Lev Mano Manovitch, qui a écrit ce livre où il, il théorise le, les écrans. Et en fait, il dit qu'il y a trois, euh, trois euh, temps à l'écran. Et le troisième temps, c'est le temps de, de l'écran d'ordinateur, mais ça aurait aussi un rapport là. C'est où on commence à voir plein de fenêtres en même temps, en fait. C'est n'est plus un écran fixe, mais c'est un écran où... Euh, et ça, c'est aussi de la fragmentation, en fait. C'est cette idée de... Euh, ouais. Sinon, avec le son... Euh, ouais. Ouais, ouais. D'ailleurs, une anecdote assez drôle, c'est qu'au Québec, on dit, euh, on dit écouter la télévision plutôt que regarder la télévision. Je n'ai jamais euh, su de, de où ça venait, mais c'est vrai qu'il y a cette idée de... Et puis après, c'est vrai que si on y pense, euh, on trouve ça bizarre de dire écouter la télévision, mais on l'écoute autant qu'on la regarde. En fait, il y a aussi du... Enfin bref, ouais. Donc, euh, ouais, merci pour cette question. Alors, vous avez un peu plus de courage maintenant Allez, hum. une question. Question. <rire> non. Alors, moi, moi j'ai beaucoup de questions, mais je vous propose de prendre une petite pause pour préparer la présentation de la recherche, du livre, de notre grande équipe sur la, sur la scène des nuits. Comme ça, on, 
on a un peu de moment pour te contacter. Et dans tous les cas, vous pouvez vous approcher enfin à une oratrice mmh. euh, et lui poser la question directement. Merci. Merci. Euh, on se revoit dans Merci. cinq minutes, OK? Merci.